Hello, hello, hello. This is Helen Thomas and the CDFM study group. All right, now I want to go over CDFM module 1.2, the manpower management. I did some slides, so I kind of want to go over the slides again. It's better for you to look at the information from different perspective to make it easier for you to remember the information. All right, let me sit up in my chair here. I'm a little twisted. All right. All right, what do we have? So the mission of the Department of Defense, remember, is to provide the forces and to provide security for our country. So there are three military departments, which is Army, Navy, Air Force, and 16 defense agencies, you know, such as like defense contracting, defense commissary, and so forth, <clears throat> for armed services. So the purpose of the military is to man equip and train the forces to meet the operational needs of those combatant commanders. So the first priority for resources goes to the combatant commanders. And so the next question should ask is, well, why do they have priority? Well, if you remember when we talked about the operational chain of command, remember the operational chain of command runs from the president to the SECDEF, to these combatant commanders. So let me get my little pointer here. So the major combatant commands, NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, AFRICOM, all of those guys, based on guidance from the Joint Chief of Staff. So what is the role of the Joint Chief of Staff? The Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff is the Senior Military Advisor to the Secretary of Defense, the President, and the National Security Council. And then you have a joint staff made up of representative, the senior military representative from the Army, the senior military representative from the Navy, and so forth. So they all make up the joint staff. They provide guidance on the way in which the military should perform to meet the national security strategy. Future Year Defense Program, I threw this in here because it comes up quite often, definitely in Module 2, some in Module 3. What is the DOD's database for summarizing resources that accomplish a mission? It includes all the MDEPs, manpower, equipment. It is called the Future Year Defense Program. So this DOD database, it breaks down I can say 11 major force programs. So every, every mission that the DOD performs, it falls into one of these major force programs. And then it tells the different funding that is needed, the resources, the manpower, the equipment that is needed to get the job done. And all of that is published in this DOD database, FYDP. Find it. <laughs> all right. Under manpower management, you also learn that the president has some authority to activate forces. That also tells you that on our typical day, the president cannot activate reserve forces. Only Congress can do that. But there are some instances where the president is allowed, and so we're going to look at that. So under Title 10 U.S. Code 12304, that should be easy to remember, gives the president the authority to activate selected reserve and ready reserve personnel. So Title 10, U.S. Code, this tells you that's the law, and the paragraph and chapter gives the president the authority to activate forces. Well, what are the conditions that must be in place for him to do that? The president can only activate forces without consent from Congress if we have threat of weapon of mass destruction or any terrorist related activity, whether major threat of terrorism or actual terroristic acts, you have to, the president can activate these forces. How long he can activate reserve forces for up to 365 days no more than 365 days. So that's his limit for a year. And he's also limited on the number of 
people that he can activate to come to active duty. No more than 200,000. So this is your total limit for that 365 days. 200,000 members made up of selected, selective reserve and individual ready reserve. And of this 200,000, no more can be 30,000 out of the individual ready reserve, the IRR. So let's look at some terms as it relates to manpower, because this may require you to do some calculations. And you have to know what the formulas are because they're not going to be given to you on the exam. So first of all, is the turnover rate. So if you're asked to calculate the turnover rate, remember it's the num total number of employees who left positions during the year divided by the number of the total number of positions. So the rate tells you that it's going to be a percentage. The value has to be written in as a percentage. And rate also tells you it's a smaller number divided by the larger number. So I gave an example. Assume you have 10 people left. You had 100 positions. Total number is 100. You have 10 people that left, so 10 divided by 100. So that means your turnover rate is 10%. Let's look at another one. The fill rate, the definition is the average number of days from when an employee leaves up until when that position is filled again. So that time lag there, the fill rate. So the example given here is assume it takes 65 days when a person re, uh, quit or retired or left PCS and it was 65 days before they was able to get another person on board or hired another person. And there are 20, 80 hours, 260 work days in a year. So within that time frame, you take the 65 days out of the 260 or divided by the 260, making your fill rate 25%. So you gotta look at the total number of years, not years, fiscal year, in the fiscal year. So however many months or days it takes. So of that 260 work days, it's 20, 80 hours. So 65 divided by 260 is 25% fill rate. Here's another rate, the lapse rate, percentage of the year that vacancy occurred. So it's the turnover rate times the fill rate equal the lapse rate. Turnover times fill equal lapse. And the number of positions to budget. So depending on how much budget you have. So 2.5% of the 100 positions are valued or filled during the year. Therefore, 100 position minus 100 times the 2. 5% equal 97.5 positions filled to the budget that you're given. Separation incentives, we talk about the DOD having the early retirement program, which is called the Voluntary Early Retirement, VERA, and the buyout program, which is the Voluntary Separation Incentive Pay, the VSIP, where they pay you to get out, you either retire or the buyout where they pay you a certain amount of money to go ahead and get out. So the DOD is limited to no more than 25,000 buyout separations per year. And it's also limited with the buyout payments, the lesser of 40,000 or the amount of your severance pay. So the lesser, if your severance pay is 30,000, that tells me you're only gonna get 30,000. So you can't go over 40,000 buyout payment limitation. And if you're an employee who accepts a buyout, cannot be reemployed for 12 months after receiving the money, receiving the funds, receiving that buyout. So you have a 12 month or a year waiting period. You took the money, you got out the Department of Defense, took a break for a year, 
then it's saying you can apply and come back in after a year. Federal activities reform. This is going into dealing with commercial activity and whether to have a contractor do a job versus keeping it inherently governmental. Trying to figure out what this is. All right, so the Inventory Reform Act of 1998 says no later than the end of the third quarter of every fiscal year, each agency is required to submit a list to Office of Management and Budget, OMB, of all the activities performed by federal sources and then those functions that are not inherently governmental. So every function that is performed by the agency must be listed and submitted to OMB by the end of the third quarter of each fiscal year, based on the Inventory Reform Law of 1998. And then OMB Circle A76, again, we've talked in the past about OMB Circle A11 which deals with budget formulation. We've talked about OMB Circular A123, I think it is, yeah, that deals with internal control. And then you have OMB Circular A76 dealing with commercial activity. That's the guidance established by Office of Management and Budget that deals with commercial activities. Classified activities into two categories. What are they? Commercial activity. Those government functions that is performed by a contractor, if you work alongside a contractor, those government functions that that contractor perform is a commercial activity versus inherently governmental activity. Those are those functions performed by only government employees, such as, let's look at, like the Fort Leavenworth prison is inherently governmental, is managed by the military. And the most efficient organization is another term that we learned in manpower management. This is the government's structure and the government's cost to perform a particular activity. So this is based on the performance work statement. The list of things that that organization or that employee must be able to do to fulfill the requirements of that job. And the performance work statement is the document that is used to send to contractors so that they can bid on that particular commercial activity. So based on DODI 4100.33 commercial activity notification, Congress must be notified when, if, the commercial activity, let's say you get ready to do a study and a, a manpower study to determine if you want to do a, com, um, a contractor or a government, MEO, then if it involves 46 or more DOD civilian personnel, then Congress must be notified before even the study is conducted. And you must also notify the government employee that the study is being conducted immediately because if they may be affected, determine, let's say the end result is we're gonna to go to a contractor and we're getting rid of the GS position, then they need to know how they will be affected. So the DOD employees must also be notified. All right, so this is the OMB circular cost competition process. So I kind of did a diagram to explain Congress being notified first and the next to last step in the process. Again, so this is scenario, there's 46 or more DOD positions that is being affected here. So Congress must approve that request to study contract. And so once Congress approves it, then you can award, the contracting office can award a study contract. And how does that look? Two things. When you start the study, 
you have to develop the MEO, the most efficient organization. That is the government structure. That's the personnel, equipment, resources for by the government. And you do an independent cost estimate later on, but you also complete the performance work statement because this is what you're gonna need here to send out to the vendors, to the contractors, so that they can put out their bid on that contract. So MEO completes an independent cost estimate by the DK, right? Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation. That's the cost guy at DOD. So they're probably the ones doing that cost estimate. And the contracting office will send out, take this performance work statement and they'll issue solicit um, bids from contractors to do that same job. And then the contractor will give their costs. And then a cost comparison is done between what it costs the government to do it inherently and what it costs the contractor to do it. So a commercial bid must be at least 10% below the in-house, which is the MEO, to be even considered or selected. And depending on whatever the decision is, you have an appeal process. So there's a timeline given if they agree to do a contract or the MEO and someone disagrees, you have an appeal process. But once the final decision is made on which direction they're gonna go, if they go to contract versus MEO, then next to last step says, Congress has to be notified of the findings, of the decisions that's been made here in this process. And then finally, once Congress is notified, the contract is awarded or the MEO is implemented. So that's just a snapshot of the cost competition process done in the OMB Circle A76. So memorize the OMB Circles because you're only going to learn a few of them in this um, CDFM, and anytime you hear, oh, that's the A76 study, you already know that's the commercial activity. Or OMB Circle A11, okay, we're talking about the budget process. So let's switch a little bit to ethics, because remember again, all of these modules includes ethics, which is fiscal law. So let's talk about gifts from outside sources. So the question I pose is, can you accept gifts from a contractor. If you're a government employee, can you accept gifts from a contract? And what this is saying is yes, you may accept a gift from a contractor if the value of that one gift is $20 or less. So let's say they give us a pen. If the value of that pen is $20 or less, and for that year, which is annual year, not to exceed a total of $50 gifts from that same contractor. So $20 or less and $50 for the year. Acceptance of gifts by injured service members and their families. Can, the, can they accept gifts? So if the service member receives the gifts, he can accept gifts up to $1,000. If the value goes over that $1,000, so let's say the individual was injured in combat. They can accept a gift and someone wants to give them a gift up to $1,000. If it exceeds the contract, then ethic officials, so your lawyers, your ethical lawyers, have to make a written determination if they can accept that gift that's worth over $1,000. So I'm thinking even the people, when they, um, let's say they give a sold service member a house. We know that's more than $1,000. So they probably have to get the ethics lawyers to do a written determination. Because again, if it's not in writing, then it didn't happen. Gifts between employees is another big one, but it talks here about individual gifts to su supervisors must not go over $10. So whenever someone comes around and they are collecting funds, okay, someone is leaving, your supervisor is leaving, your senior, Leaders are leaving, and would you like to donate? Under ethical, ethics, you should only donate up to $10. Employees, and again, it's a choice. 
Employees may contribute on a voluntary basis, right? So it's a choice. And a DOD employee, employee may not. So if you're a supervisor and you accept a gift, you have to make sure that the value of the gift does not exceed $300. I don't know if most people ask, but in most cases, it shouldn't. The $10, $10 limitation still applies here also. Another big pocket in ethics or issue that can come in is honorarium. The Title V here tells you that we're talking about DOD civilian because your military members will be covered under Title X and your National Guard is covered under Title 32. So those are the three, Title X, military members, that's like your active army, reserve, and then your National Guard is Title 32 and your DOD civilians, government civilian, DOD civilians is Title V. So Title V says, as a, and you know already, if you're in uniform, you can't accept a gift from anybody because you're a soldier, you're an airman, you're a Marine. So U.S. says, may prohibit you from getting money to do a lecture. So the example I use here with honoraria is, let's say a college, you graduated from the University of North Carolina and you are invited in your official capacity as a DOD civilian. Then what this is saying, if the college wants to reimburse you, pay you for you to come to speak, to, to participate in any activity, you cannot accept payment for that because you're going to that event on your official title as the chief, as the deputy, as the director, or whatever your title is. So on the flip side to that, if you're invited because you're an alumni of that school or because you graduated because they want to just you to come to speak to the graduating class to show how you mapped out your success since graduation then yes you can accept but whenever you don't know what to do always seek out your ethics official your lawyers your jag personnel to make sure can i accept funding honoraria because even in a sense of me doing this study group i've had people approach me contractors hey can you come to my organization and we'll pay you to teach the cdfm to our folks or to study with our folks because i can't really teach it i'm really to facilitate and of course i already knew the answer but then i also did the extra step and went to the ethics lawyer and he's he I was advised no because you're technically working for the government and these contractors are working for the government so you cannot do that in your official capacity so honoraria that's accepting money for doing a lecture or a speech for a commercial or civilian organization and what about if you work for the gov for the dod and then you retire and you want to work for a civilian so two restrictions for government employees involving specific parties they were involved with, with while working that mean either i was a contracting officer representative and i worked with this vendor or i was a gpc a government purchase card holder and i used to do business with this vendor and now i'm i got out of the military and i want to go work for that company if the employee was personally involved with a company while working for the government, that employee is permanently barred from representing that company to the government. That means when I flip side and I go work for that government, that, that civilian company, I guess I can do that, but I am not supposed to act now on behalf of that because I know the ins and outs of the government to try to use that to get my get business for my new organization and if the matter was under the employee's responsibility during the last year of work but i was not directly participating in the action let's say i was a supervisor i was the director and then my subordinates were actually dealing with the company it also says that the employees barred for two years after leaving the government if i want to go work for that company so 
ethics, responsibilities of things that we need to know, the do's and don'ts. And again, we cannot only just rely on our lawyers as financial managers. We too need to know what is what right looks like. All right, I think we are at the end of the slide. So I want to make sure that I remind you to, if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to our YouTube page. Not only will you be notified of upcoming videos as I put them out there, but what it does, it publicizes the videos on YouTube and allow YouTube to push the videos out so people can start finding the information. So please consider subscribing. Leave comments on the videos, like, um, share them with others because your comments also, it will let me know, okay, if things, the information looks correct, can you see the slides? So a lot of the slides I'm redoing because when I go back now and I start looking, some of it is not clear, you can't really see the information. And so if you see something like that, leave a note, then let me know so I can go back and make the correction. So thank you guys. This is Helen Thomas and the CDFM study group. I'll see you guys again next time.